So the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is uh, very politically incorrect these days. Uh, when we read this kind of a story, when we, re- we read what preceded this as well about uh, Lot and his family arriving in, in, in Sodom and the, with his companions, so angels by all accounts, and the, the men of the town seeing them and, oh, look at these new people, let, let us have intercourse with them. That's basically what scripture tells us. They just see these new people and uh, immediately uh, it, there's, there's an indication of, of just how base the city has become how immoral it has become. When, when we think of the destruction of a city, which is, it's, it's going to happen, sorry, spoiler alert, uh, you probably knew that, uh, the, the cities are going to be destroyed by God, we think, bless, that sounds really harsh of God, it sounds very angry. Now, we have to be careful of a couple of things here, okay. So, sacred scripture is divine revelation. It aims to reveal God. He wants to reveal who God is and how God is, so how God thinks and what, what God wants from us, how God wants us to live, okay? So what, what is this revealing to us about God? There's a couple of things that we should be attentive to here. Firstly, God is the giver of life and is the one who decides how, that life, long, how long that life will be. So it kind of is up to him when we eventually go. Okay, now this isn't something that we can say, well, if God does it, then we can do it. So we can't say, well, Cork City is an awful dive, right? There's the amount of sin going on there. Let's blow the place up because God did it. No, we can't do that, obviously. But if God were to say, if God in his divine intelligence, understanding, were to look at a place that's so immoral, now then there's a, imagine like a, a city where, Everyone is living in, in fear and anger and revenge and rape is a daily thing and uh, thievery and, and uh, violence and, and sexual indecency and immodesty and people sleep, all the, everyone sleep with everyone else, like just the, the, the insanity of it all. And then, then the next generation are doing the same because that's what they've seen their parents do. And then the next generation follow on the, that, that hatred and that immorality because that's what they've seen their grandparents and their parents do. There actually would come a point where the, the Lord would say it's actually an act of mercy to say, Stop. Stop. This stops now. It's, it's actually an act of God's mercy for the Lord to intervene and actually, as I say, everyone in the, in the city, they're going to die eventually anyway. Again, this is, it's, not that, it's not that because that's going to happen, we can end their lives. But if God were to say, you know, we have to, we have to reboot, we have to start this again. Because... The, why, why, ha- why allow generation after generation after generation to be created and all of them lose heaven? Do you know, that's, that, that's not what God's fatherly heart wants. So it, it's actually better that these lives, again, f- from a divine perspective, we can't do it. I have to keep saying this, like, I'm never just, we can never justify genocide or anything like that. It's, uh, but if God is to say that this city has gone so far that now we just need to restart, S- similarly uh, as, uh, as in the time of Noah, then if that's, if that's what needs to happen, God can allow that. Okay, God can ordain that. We can't, he can. And it's actually, as I say, an act of mercy. Because if, if you're living in that city and you have to get revenge on this other family because they did something to you and so on and so forth, and, and there's, as I say, like, just the, the, the level of, 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 of... They're so far from God. When we think, you see, we're not just called to this baseline of just don't kill anybody. But we're called to, to live for God in order that we choose him for all eternity. Now, if generation after generation are choosing sin wholesale and being separated from God for all eternity, this life is so, so, so short in comparison. So if the Lord, as I say, ends a city, when you know, the average age, the mean age there be 50, 60, whatever it is, again, he can do that if it's going to save lives for all eternity. So we have to be careful that this, this, reading something like this doesn't actually damage our understanding of God. Now, just to, to clarify then, we get into a little more detail as to how God's heart works. Abraham intervenes and he says, well, yeah, but not every, surely not everybody in the city is going to be bad. What if there were 50? What if there were 45, 40, 30? What if there were 10 just men? This shows us two very, very important things. Number one, God says, if there are 10 just men, I will not destroy the city. 
And can you think of, you know, Cork, 120,000, Dublin, whatever, a million and a half. Um, if there are 10 just people there, I won't destroy it. That shows us two things. Number one, just how merciful God is. Like 10, that's you know, two average Catholic families these days. Um, I, two just families. 10 just people, and I won't destroy the whole city. That, that also shows us just how bad Sodom and Gomorrah were. There weren't even 10. Two just families. There weren't even... Like, that, that, that's how deplorable, how, how depraved the whole thing had become. There weren't even 10. So it shows us two things. It shows us how merciful God is. If he finds any good at all, any good at all, that's enough for him. I will save the whole city if they're just 10 good people. And secondly, it shows us the power and importance of our intercession. The power and importance of my faith. Right, so Abraham intervening, interceding for the cities. Lord, you, won't, you wouldn't destroy them all if there were 10. Well, okay, if you ask me, if there are 10, I will not. So it shows us the power of, of our intercession. We can actually pray even for the salvation of a whole city. And secondly, it shows us uh, how, how important an individual's faith is. Our, our individual faith isn't just for you. It's, it has an effect on those around you. And our, our faith, it's just an, inst- an astounding thought that 10 people, 10 just people, 10 people who love the Lord could prevent a whole city from being destroyed. This is how pivotal, how crucial your faith is and my faith is. It's, it, 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 it's an amazing reality to think of that my faith matters because, do you know the way today faith is, it, it, it's been reduced to a personal choice, a personal issue, and a very, very private one as well. You know, your faith is it's, it's a private thing. Don't, don't be externalizing your faith now with your religious symbols. Don't be talking about it in the public sphere. If you're a politician, just keep your faith to yourself, right? You do your politics. Don't mix faith and politics. It's a, faith is so private, such a private thing. But we forget that it, 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 it isn't. It isn't. It isn't a private thing. My faith affects other people. My faith has an influence on my family, and my family will have an influence on my neighborhood, and my neighborhood will have an influence on my city, for good and for bad. So my faith isn't private. It, it, it will affect others, especially if you're religious, especially if you're a priest, especially if you're, if you're visible, then your faith will absolutely affect people. If a priest falls, he can bring a whole parish with him. So our faith isn't, it's not a private matter. It's, this, this affects others. We're, we're, we're linked, we're, we're part of a body, right? And if you've got a good heart, well then, thankfully, your brain should get enough blood because your heart's working. There's no point saying, my, my, you know, my brain is healthy, I couldn't care less about my heart. No, if your heart goes, it's going to bring the brain with it, right? So we're, it, it, we're a body, we're, we're, we're linked. The, the, the health of, of, of one organ will positively affect another and so on. It, help, it helps the health, the health of the whole body. When we think of uh, St. Irenaeus, uh, St. Irenaeus was an absolutely fantastic author and uh, defender of the faith. Um, there are a couple of quotations which, uh, the most famous uh, quotation from him is, is probably, the, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. Okay, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. And that makes sense when we think of how we have been created or who we have been created to be. We have been created for God. We've been created for him. We've been created for heaven. So we've been created uh, not just, as I say, to live here on earth and have fun and uh, have kids and build houses and then we die, but we've been created here to find God and, and be lived in by him and then transformed into him that we can actually share his nature in heaven. So he also says, God did not tell us to follow him. Think of our gospel today. God did not tell us to follow him because he needed our help, but because he knew that loving him would make us whole. God knew that if we love him, then we will be whole. So the glory of God is the human being fully alive. The glory of God is the human being indwelt by God when we're lived in by God himself. Uh, I have a... A soft spot for St. Irenaeus as well because he had a real soft spot for Our Lady. 
and one of my favourite quotations of his, and, and to think of how powerful this statement is, and also from a, a theological perspective, how early this was said, in about the year 160, right? So this isn't any sort of, a, I don't know, uh, a devotional thing that came about uh, before the Reformation and, 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 and you know, drove Martin Luther or, or others to split from the church. Right from the second century, Our Lady was held in such high esteem by, by, by the church, by bishops, by the faithful. And he says, being obedient, Mary became the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Did you pick that up? Cause of our salvation. Our Lady, the cause of our salvation. That's a huge statement. Right? Our Lady becomes the cause of our, no, she's not our saviour, but the cause of our salvation through her, we get Jesus. Okay, her yes in the work of the Holy Spirit. So again, being obedient, Mary became the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. The knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the Virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful words and beautiful truths expressed there by St. Irenaeus. So, our faith isn't, isn't a private matter. My faith affects others. God will save. Uh, he, 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 he will, he will, he's, he's as positive as could be. If there's anything positive at all, that's what he will nurture, that's what he, that's what he will look at, that's what he will choose to see. And so my faith, my faith affects others. My intercession, my prayer can have a positive effect on others and the Lord will choose mercy over justice if it's at all possible. And so we ask the good Lord today when we think of uh, this month of June, this month dedicated to the Sacred Heart which now has been a such hijacked and, hijacked and has become this Pride Month, this month which aims to veer people away from God's plan for their happiness. We ask the good Lord to intercede for each one of us. We ask the Lord to deepen our faith. All of you watching at home or listening to this homily, your faith matters. It matters in, in your family and in your neighborhood. Let us be proud of our faith, of this great gift that we've been given let us be proud of this relationship with Jesus Christ, which is life-giving. And may we imitate Our Lady and assist in the salvation of souls. Amen. <laughs>